Good morning, St. Mark. We'll do that one again. Good morning, St. Mark. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with you all this morning. We welcome all of you who are worshiping with us in person and also those who are worshiping with us online. We're so happy to be together through the power and the ether of the internet. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we extend a special welcome to you. And whether you've been here once, twice, or a hundred times, we're happy to be together today. I have a few announcements to call our attention to. The first is that next Sunday is the 2nd of July, and because it is near to the 4th of July holiday, we will have one service at 10 a.m. So rather than the 9 o'clock worshiping at 9, 11 o'clock worshiping at 11, we will worship all together in one hour at 10 a.m. next Sunday. So please mark your calendars accordingly. Um, if you're here at 11 next week, you'll be here just in time um, to wish everyone well on a wonderful week ahead. Um, also, we'll have uh, more on this later, but uh, the Pride auction concluded last night, and so Noe Brera-Dissler, uh, part of our Pride committee, will be, oh, she's hugging folks, but Noe Brera-Dissler will be available if you won a Pride auction item. Um, she will be available after service to make sure that your goodies get to you in a timely fashion. There's a lot going on in the life of the church, and so I encourage you to follow our social media, sign up for the e-remarks, and follow us on our website so that you can be involved um, in all of the wonderful things that we have going on. Here at St. Mark, we believe that all of us are beloved children of God. No matter who we are, no matter who we love, no matter where we're from or what we're about, we all bear the divine spark within us. And so as we enter into our time of worship, let us meditate upon the generous heart of God.
time, I invite you to rise in either body or spirit as we join together in our call to worship. As we are called into worship today, let us remember how God shaped and formed us with his own two hands, like clay in the potter's hand. God made us, loved us, and kept us like treasure encapsulated in living clay. We open our eyes to see God's glory. We open our ears to hear the creator's wisdom. We open our hands to offer the divine gifts. We open our mouths to sing Jehovah's praise. We open our hearts to offer God our love. The Lord is God. And now let us raise our voices together as we sing, Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Friends, let us remain standing as we pray our prayer of confession together. Almighty God, we confess that though you marked all humanity with your divine image and have poured the priceless treasure of your holy presence into us, who but are jars of clay, we do not always honor your gift and we fail to see your image in the people your hands fashioned. We fail to live as bearers of your divine presence, and in doing so, fail to protect 
preserve the dignity of others. If we fail to love, we lose hope, and fail to forgive others and ourselves. Forgive us, we pray. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that he gave up his only and treasured son so that we might live. Let us all treasure God, the creator, son, and Holy Spirit, and one another in holy love and grace. Beloved, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Friends, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And now as a forgiven and reconciled people, may we extend the peace and the joy of Christ to one another. As we come back together and continue in our worship, we enter now into the time of our prayers where it's the opportunity for us to, to name and lift up the prayers that we bring with us to worship today, to lift them up together. As we begin, I want to share with you just a few things. First, some uh, prayer concerns to keep, to keep with you this day and throughout the week. Uh, first, Daryl Hartley's sister, uh, Shirley Altman, passed away this week, and the graveside service will be this afternoon in South Carolina. Uh, so we're, we're asking you to keep Daryl and Joe and the entire family in your prayers throughout this week. Also, one of our longtime St. Mark members, Keith Poss, passed away in his sleep this week. We ask that you keep in your prayers his husband, Julius, and the entire family. Some celebrations that we bring with us this morning uh, and we offer up together to God. Uh, this week, this past week, the St. Mark Choir uh, participated uh, in the unfurling of the sacred pride cloth flag on Tuesday of last week. We were um, the only religious institution that was there and participating as part of that. And so we celebrate that. It was an honor to be a part of that historic event. Also, I'm so happy to, to share with you that uh, the Pride Auction, which closed last night, uh, raised around $6,000. Thank you to the generosity and faithfulness of so many here. And as part of our celebrations, next Sunday we will have the opportunity to come together as one community to worship together, whether we typically worship at 9 o'clock or come during the 11 o'clock hour, because we're going to have one service next Sunday at 10 o'clock. And I name that as a praise because I think it's always a beautiful opportunity when we can come together as one church family. So begin praying for that service this week. All of the other things that you bring with you today, I invite you to hold them in your heart as we join now together in prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, come and still our hearts today as we come into these moments of worship and into these moments of prayer. Come and pour your Holy Spirit out upon us, awaken us, stir us, challenge us, make us new. Awaken us to the sacred goodness that resides in each one of us. 
And even as we worship today, we're reminded just how fragile life is. It's a gift that flows from your heart to be sure, but there is so much around that reminds us that that it is a thin gift. We hold all of those things up today. We're reminded today that we are fragile, O oh God. Even with all of our gifts, our strengths, our talents, all the masks that we wear, and no matter how much we try to put our best self forward, we are reminded constantly that we are part of something greater than ourselves. And deep in our souls, we know that it is by your grace that we live and we move and we have our being. And yet, in all of this fragility, we are reminded today just how beautiful life is. That it is gift. It is holy. That we are all made in your image and we share in your goodness. We share something of your heart. Even if we hold it, this treasure in clay vessels. So remind us today, O oh God, that we are part of something beautiful, something eternal, something bigger than self. We are part of a story, a promise, that even though things may seem broken in our lives, things may seem broken in our hearts, things may seem broken in the world, that with you, light and goodness can flow and shine through even the jagged and broken pieces. And so it's in that hope and that promise that as we worship today, we lift up to you prayers for the world, the world and all of its fragility and all of its brokenness, for wars that seem to be on a never-ending repeat of violence, for the grief that lies behind all of the news stories that we seem to read over quickly, for the earth and all of creation that we so easily neglect in all of our illusions of control. We pray today in the best ways that we can for those who we love, for our families, our friends. We pray even for our enemies. We pray for the sick. We pray for the dying, knowing that they too are part of this great story of promise and hope these treasures and clay vessels. We pray for this midtown community in which we are situated, in which you call us to serve and to be in mission. May we know our community and see you at work in and through the people that are here. And may all who live in this area know that this is a safe place where we can be fragile together and be made strong by God's grace not by our egos, not by our accomplishments. And so we pray for your church, your church here in this place, and your church everywhere. Turn our inner eyes to all of those things that are not always so easily seen, things like faith and justice and hope and love. And may these be our highest priorities. For we trust today that even in the imperfection and the broken pieces of our prayers, you hear us, you hold all that we offer, and you are the light that brings forth goodness. So hear the prayers of our hearts this day, the prayers of this community, as we join our voices together now in praying the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord be with you, St. Mark. In the beauty of prayer, you sense the presence of God. Did anyone else sense God in this place this morning? 
I'm sure you're saying yes, I'm just not hearing you. <laughs> St. Mark, we want to keep on thanking you for your generosity. Um, your giving is making a difference in the life of our church, in the ministries that we do. I'm sure when you came in this morning, if you parked in the deck and you walked on Fifth Street, you will see all the scaffolding that is up. And it's looking a little bit rough right now, but by the end of the week, they will have all the safety netting and the fencing going around. It will, look, it will look better then. But all of that is only possible because of what you have done over the years. Those who came before you, those who were there in the early days of the church, all of your giving makes a difference in who we are as St. Mark and what we do. And so know that when you give, your giving is making a difference I shared in my senior pastor note on Friday that the Wesleywood Foundation board member wrote to me to say, thank you, St. Mark. Thank you for giving, because your giving is changing the lives of so many who live at Wesleywood. So not just for our building, not just for the ministries that we do here at St. Mark, like the Tuesday evening supper club that we have or the Saturday morning breakfast club, but far beyond the walls of this church, your generosity is making a, give, a difference. So know that when you give, be it as the plates pass you when the ushers are coming up, or if you give online, or if you give through the app, or if you send your, your check into the church, know that your giving is indeed making a difference. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. God, all that we have comes from you, and it is off your own hands that we now give back a portion so bless these gifts and allow your good love, your goodness, your mercies and your grace continue to be at work in us so that we can go out and be your vessels in the world. This we pray now in the name of Christ. Amen.
invite you to remain standing and body your spirit for the reading of the gospel. Before we read the gospel, I believe we'd be remiss not to thank our musicians today, helping out Amy Holloway, Phil Crumley, and Lee Easter for lending their musical talents for worship uh, while Jonathan Easter is out of town. We give great thanks for all of you. Thank you so much. And now, friends, hear the gospel lesson this morning, which comes to us from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 to 31. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not sparrows sold for, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Beloved, this is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This is the time in our worship service that we set aside for our younger church, and I would invite any young people to come down and join me down front. You can be young in age. You can be young in spirit, in heart, in any shape or form of youngness that you exist in. You're welcome to come on down. All righty, so we've got one, two, three, all right, good, 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 good. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, you know, um, this morning, um, Megan is going to read for, for uh, a scripture, I think it's uh, 2 Corinthians verse 4, chapter 4, okay? And in that scripture, it's going to talk about some vessels, some containers, and it's going to talk about vessels of uh, clay. Well, this morning, we don't have clay vessels, but we do have some other vessels, and they're made out of, what do you think? Say what? No, the, the vessel, it hit it, touch it. What you think? Glass. Yes, these are glass. And although um, the clay vessels are fragile, these vessels are fragile as well. But you know what? These vessels contain something. Gabby, would you reach over and get that vessel right over there and open it up? And let's see what it's got inside. Hmm. Okay. We're pulling out a treasure. And what do you, what does your treasure say? Love. Love is a treasure, folks. It really is. Would you set that, uh, yeah, do good? Very good. And we're going to turn it around and we're going to sit it up so that everyone can see this vessel contain love. All right. So would you get this one and then give it to your sister? Would you give that one to Danny? Thank you. All right, Daniela. What does your vessel have in it? What treasure does your vessel have? Faith. All right. If you would be so kind as to put that jar right here and then put faith in front of it so that we know that we've got vessels full of treasures. There's love and there's faith. All right. Would you be so kind as to open that one for us, please? Yes. And let's see what treasure you've got in your vessel. Hmm. Kind of hard to come out, isn't it? Oh, it's a long one. Oh, my goodness. Kindness. Kindness. Oh, my. Goodness, that is a good treasure. If you would put that vessel back here, yes, and then we'll try to put kindness in front of it. Yes, we will. And since you are doing such a good job, open this one for us as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our last vessel contains one more treasure. And what might that treasure be? Humility. Oh, my goodness. Humility. Oh, that is a good one. A lot of folk need some humility up in here. Okay, if you, <laughs> but we're working on it. We're working on it. All of us are a work in progress. You all have done such a good job at revealing some of the treasures that we have in these vessels. These vessels are fragile. If we drop them, they will crack. The clay vessels are fragile, but the treasure that's inside of them is what's most important. Would you pray with me? 
God of your infinite wisdom and love, you have come into our lives this morning and allowed us to be in this house of worship. And we've discovered some things, God. We've discovered some treasures. We've discovered love. We've discovered humility. We've discovered faith and kindness. Let us be able to use these treasures in this world so that you are made known to those who don't know you. This is our prayer, oh God, that we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Our second scripture lesson for today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. Hear these words. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, 
always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with the scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we believe and so we speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even, through our outer, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an internal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. How do you know if someone is legitimate or not? How would you be able to tell if someone is the real deal? What would you look for? What are the things that would make you know if this person that you're looking at is really who he or she says that he or she is? We live in a world where a person's appearance is used as ways to measure their social status or even their worth, to measure their abilities or their inabilities. Our society's metrics for measuring or evaluating someone's standing or capabilities tend to be based on how they look, what they wear, and even what they say. As humans, we have the tendency to look on the outward appearance, and then from what we see, we use that to decide who someone is. But we all know, church, we all know that outward appearance is misleading at best and deceptive at worst. We know that judging someone by how they look or what they wear or what they drive or how they speak, and even just by their posture, will cause us to form wrong opinions about that person. We know that outward appearance is a faulty guide to evaluate who someone truly is. Some time ago, I was talking to an acquaintance of mine, and he knows just how to get under my skin. He would say things like, Carolyn, give me some money. And I would say, where am I supposed to get money from? And he will say stuff like, but aren't all pastors rich? Pastors have money. And he will go on, and as he goes on, I start getting a little bit more riled up, and he will say, but, you know, the church is a business. You know that, right? And the more he does it, the more I get riled up. He just simply knows how to get under my skin. And I can, some, at some point in the conversation, when I see his eyes just widening and his grin getting larger, I realize he was just pulling my leg because he does it so often. One day, talking to a friend of mine about this acquaintance, my friend said to me, you know that there is this concept, this idea that pastors are rich, right? She said, have you ever watched Pastors of LA, this reality show that they have on cable? And I said, no. She said, you should watch it. Now, I've never watched it, but I've seen some clips, and I've seen, and I've read some articles. And I don't know these pastors, I've never met them, but the idea behind the reality show is that when you are a pastor and you are blessed by God, you should drive the most expensive vehicles, you should have the most glamorous life, you should live in the biggest house, you should have all the blings and everything that goes with it. And that's what makes you truly blessed by God. 
that flashiness, that glamour, that lifestyle. And apparently that is how you can tell that you are blessed by God when you have that particular lifestyle. I was shocked when I saw the clips. I was shocked when I read some of the things that were said about these pastors. On the other hand, several years ago, I went to Glen Memorial United Methodist Church, and my first time hearing the Reverend William Barber, the Reverend Dr. William Barber preached. I wanted to go to that church because he was going to preach on what it means for us as a church to live as the children of God in the world how we should stand up for justice and righteousness, how we should live in ways that others would come to know God. It was my first time actually seeing him. And Reverend Barber, when he got up after he was introduced, he got up and I saw that he had a cane and his form was a little bit bent and he was walking with a limp, having someone helping to assist him to get to the rostrum. When I listened to him, he was one of the best preachers I've ever heard, talking about the gospel and what it means for us as bearers of the gospel to live in the world. Just recently, I read an article of Reverend Barber giving his final sermon at the Christian church where he served for over 30 years because he was moving on to do something else. And he tells the story of how when he was called to be the pastor of the church, he had just gotten a diagnosis about his back and how his spine was fusing, the vertebrae in his back were fusing with each other. And it caused him to go into depression. And one of the elders of the denomination called him and said to him, William, I think you probably should consider another form of career. I think you should consider another vocation because I don't think any church wants a cripple to be their pastor. Reverend Barber said the, the, the advice of this officer sent him into depression, made him wonder but he said it's in that state of brokenness, it's in that state of woundedness, in that state of depression that he had to lean in further upon God, lean in deeper into God and trust in the God who had called him to take on the assignment of being the pastor. He shared with his congregation that this is a testimony of the cripple, of what God can do even with the most broken person and even in the most broken places of our lives, how God can use us for what God has intended. He, tell, he told the story to this church as he was leaving them. He spoke openly about what had happened and how he felt. And, and even now, he still has that limp gait and he still has the, the curvature of his spine. But he's one of the most powerful and anointed preachers I've ever heard. Telling the story of the cripple. We live in a time, especially when American Christianity tells us that if you are blessed by God, you should look a certain way, you should be a certain way. We live in a time when others will look on the exterior to determine whether or not you are in, whether or not you are legitimate, whether or not that you have it. But Paul tells us otherwise. In the passage of Scripture we heard Megan read earlier, Paul begins by saying that we have this treasure in jars of clay. And before, earlier in, in verse 6, Paul was telling the early believers in Corinth that God had given unto them this particular knowledge of who God is through the face of Jesus Christ. And it's a surpassingly great knowledge that they have. But then he goes on to say, we have this treasure this treasure of the knowledge of who God is in jars of clay. If you know anything about jars of clay, you know they're fragile. They're easily broken. Recently, we went on a staff trip 
to, to get a, a day away from the office, and we did some painting of, of jars. We did painting of, of, of clay that were made into different vessels, and I chose one that is a pitcher. And even as I held that pitcher in my hand, I realized how fragile it was. And this is what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, whatever you see come from us, our ability to tell you about God, our ability to preach, our ability to heal, whatever you see, it is not of us because we are clay. We are so easily broken. It's the treasure. It's the power of God in us. Do not mistake it to be us, church. It's the treasure of God in us. And to back that up, Paul went on to tell them about the sufferings that they encountered as they were doing the work of God. And even as they suffered, even as they went through the trials and the tribulations that they had experienced, God's grace was there to keep them and to support them. That in the end, Paul said, even though we are beaten, even though we are flogged, even though we are persecuted, we are not in despair, we are not cast down. Because God's grace is there. And our light, our, our afflictions that we encounter are so pale in comparison to what we will receive in the end. Treasures in jars of clay. Treasures in jars of clay. You see, church, God has chosen the base things of the world, the simple things of the world to confound the wise. As humans, we have, we have stacked up what we believe are, are, are the, the, the measurements for being someone of worth or being someone of value. But all of us, all of us are jars of clay. We live in a world today where they tell you if you are a Christian and you're going through hardship, you're not praying enough. If you're struggling, you're not faithful enough. If you're suffering difficulties, you're not call it, calling upon God enough. You know that prosperity kind, right? You, you need to pray harder, give more, you know, do, do more of this and God will bless you. And Paul draws us back to the truth that we are all broken vessels. We are all jars of clay, so fragile, so easily broken. And it's never about us. Whatever we do that is of any good is simply because of God's power residing in us. Treasures in jars of clay. So this morning, St. Mark, I stand before you. And I say to you that you will encounter, and you have already encountered hardship. You will encounter difficulties, and you have already encountered difficulties. But let no one tell you that because of what you have encountered, because of what you have experienced, that you do not bear the image of God. All of us are simply jars of clay. And whatever good that you do, St. Mark, no, it's not of your own strength, but it's because of the power of God at work in you. Treasure in jars of clay. We will encounter ever so often those moments when life throws us a curveball and we are faced with circumstances that we don't know how to wade through those waters. But we will not be the first. We will not be the only ones who have suffered. If we look through scripture, we see from the early stages where people like Joseph and Job and Jesus and the apostles, they all suffered, they all went through persecutions, they all experienced trials. Let no one tell you that when you're struggling or when you're suffering, it's because you do not have enough Jesus. Let no one tell you that. Let no one tell you that what you're going through is because you don't have enough faith. All of us are jars of clay. All of us are fragile. But the truth is, it's in this fragility that the power of God is able to work. It's in this brokenness that God is able to work. You see, later on, Paul tells them, most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my weakness so that the power of God may rest upon me. Church, God did not call the strong. 
God did not call the glamorous. God did not call the fancy. God calls the simple. God calls the humble. God calls those who know that the power is not of themselves, but of the Holy Spirit. God did not call those who want to brag about what they can do or what they have. God calls those who know that anything good that can ever be done is only through God. So this morning I stand before you and I tell you that God has a way of using and God has a track record of using the insignificant. God has a track record of using the broken. God has a track record. Just, just, just go back and read through scripture and look at some of the people that God had chosen to do the things that they had done, to do the work that God had called them to do. It's never the wise. It's not usually the rich. It's not usually the proud. It's not usually those who, you know, push, this, push their chest out and say, I can do this. It's the simple, the humble, the base things that God used. And so as a church this morning, we have had our history. We, we have had persons targeting us. We have had persons saying things about us. We have had our brokenness and our woundedness. But it's in all of that, it's in all of this that we bear that the power of God is revealed in us and through us to others. So as you go out into the world this week, when you leave this place today, St. Mark, go knowing that you have the treasure this treasure of God in you that no one can take from you. No one can take it away from you. But don't keep the treasure to yourself. You see, God is a generous God. Don't keep it to yourself. Share it with others. This treasure, when, when, you, when you recognize it, you know it's not something you can keep to yourself. Share it with others. Go into your world and change your world with that power of God that is in you. Go into your business places and your communities and your neighborhoods and change it with that power of God in you. But let no one tell you that you do not have God within you. Let no one tell you that the Holy Spirit is not upon you. Because all of us, it doesn't matter who we are, all of us have the image of God printed on us, imprinted in our hearts. All of us. Treasure in jars of clay. Let me see the hands of those who are jars of clay. Because I am. God's treasure is in all of you. It's in all of us. Let's go into the world with this knowledge. Amen. As we respond to God's word today, I invite you to rise in body and or spirit as we affirm together our faith using the, using the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed there in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
treasures in jars of clay, the power of God in us, we who are broken, we who are fragile. But I thank God that God does not look at our strength. God does not look at our abilities. God does not look at anything on the outside. God is good and faithful, and so God offers to us the opportunity to partake in what God is doing in the world. So St. Mark, as you go today, go knowing that you are bearers of this treasure, treasure that money could never buy, treasure that is eternal, and go and change your world. In the name of God the Creator, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen.